There is an inherent optimism in young people that older people find both amusing and disturbing at the same time. Let me explain what I mean. We are amused at the optimism of youth because we remember when we had all kinds of hopes and dreams and plans for life, many of which were not realistic. I don't know about you, but my life doesn't look very much anything like I thought it would look like when I was in my 20s. And so when I hear young people saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be that, I kind of smile to myself. But we're also somewhat disturbed when we see young folks launching out into the world because we know what they don't yet know, that life is in fact filled with failures and with disappointments. No matter what you do, you can't make life be everything that you want it to be. And there is no way to understand that about life apart from the wisdom that comes only through experience. You have to live it. And unfortunately, each generation has to go through this painful cycle of discovery. Now, in our culture, we call the good life the American dream. But every culture has its own vision of living life to the fullest. One of the reasons we have civilization at all is this common human goal of a happy life. All of the great civilizations in history, including our own, came into being as an attempt to pursue and to capture and then to preserve the dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's why we have civilization, is that pursuit of happiness. All of the forces of history run in this direction. So all through history, man has been seeking the good life, the happy life. Now, secular people believe that this desire for a better life is the result of the relentless progress of evolution. But people with a biblical worldview have a different explanation for human endeavor. We know that all people, whether they know it or not or believe it or not, all people are haunted by the collective memory of what happened in Eden. And so our search, man's search for a perfect life in this world or what some have called the dream of a utopia, a perfect society. This is really a vain attempt to go back to Eden. We all sense, the human race collectively senses that we have lost something and we're trying to get it back. Now to really understand the human condition, we have to understand the biblical doctrine of the fall. Sin has introduced a curse of corruption and death, even on the creation itself. And this brings frustration or vanity to human life in the world. Vanity is a word that means a pointless activity that leads to frustration. It's like a dog chasing its tail, going round and round in circles, not really accomplishing anything. That's, that's what we mean by by vanity. People are born, they struggle for that good and happy life, they get old and then they die. And then the cycle is repeated. This seemingly endless and ultimately hopeless cycle is the reality that permeates all philosophical and religious thought and it's even expressed in a book of the Bible. Do you know which one? The book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon says vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And he was right just from a worldly perspective. The question is, is can this cycle be broken? Can this cycle of vanity be broken? Or is there really anything new under the sun? Is there? Solomon asked that question, and his, his answer was, well, I can't see anything new. Everything just keeps going in, in one vicious cycle. Birth, struggle, death. Birth, struggle, death. Death. 
Everyone wants to have hope that things can and will get better. We even want hope beyond the grave. The book of Revelation is designed to give us hope. Aren't you thankful Ecclesiastes is not the last word in the biblical canon? The apostle John is given a vision of the future and he sees a new world coming into view. He says at the beginning of, of chapter 21, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. The first heavens and earth had passed away. Now, when we come to the end in Revelation, it actually takes us back to the beginning, to Genesis. The Bible begins with the creation of the present heavens and earth, and the Bible ends with the passing of this creation and the beginning of a new creation. Revelation 21 and 22 reminds us of Genesis 1 through 3. And these sections of scripture provide us with the perfect bookends to God's story. Amen. You see, the Bible is one contiguous story. And we have to understand scripture this way or we will miss the proverbial forest for all the trees. And many people do that with the Bible. Some scholars have said that the Bible contains one mega narrative or storyline that is filled in with many meta narratives or smaller stories. But the smaller stories always contribute to the, longer, to the larger story. The story arc or mega narrative of the Bible is creation, new creation. That's how it began. That's how things end. In Genesis, we see the beginning of the world that we know. The first creation and the fall of man are the foundation for the rest of the biblical story. Now, in, in the modern times, the first few chapters of the Bible about how the world began have been seriously questioned, criticized, and largely abandoned as an explanation for the origin and condition of the world. The book of Revelation has been historically on the fringe of the biblical canon, and has most, it is mostly considered an impossible puzzle to solve, even by people in the church. Now, if the first chapters of the Bible are rejected outright, and the last chapters of the Bible remain mysterious, it's no wonder that our modern generation remains ignorant of the message of the Bible. But if we compare the first chapters of the Bible with the last chapters of the Bible, we begin to see an integrated picture emerge. In Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth. In Revelation, this first heaven and earth pass away, and there is a new heavens and earth. In Genesis, God made everything good, but man fell into sin. Sin introduced a curse of frustration and death. In Revelation, the curse is lifted. All of the unhappy effects of sin are gone forever. In Genesis, before man sinned, God walked with man in fellowship. Sin caused a separation or an alienation between God and man. But in Revelation, the dwelling of God is with men again. The alienation has been completely removed. Perhaps the most important connection between Genesis and Revelation is the tree of life. The tree of life was there in Eden, but when man ate from the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the way back to the tree of life was blocked, which was actually a merciful thing. But in Revelation, the tree of life reappears and is prominent in the new creation. Even the leaves of the tree have healing power, let alone what the fruit's going to do for us. In other words, we're going to have full access to the very source of eternal life. And so you see, we've come full circle. What was broken by man's sin, God has restored. This does not mean, I want to make this very clear, lest I be misunderstood in the rest of this message. I am not saying that this means that God is simply restoring the original state that was in Eden. We can never go back to Eden as if the fall never happened. Actually, the world to come is much better and more glorious than Eden ever was or could have been. So please understand me, I am not saying that, re that redemption is just fixing things. Redemption is more, it does fix things, but it's even more than just fixing what was old. Amen. The newness of life in the new creation includes some continuity with the old. Our text does not say, I make all new things, but I make all things new. 
But new wine has to be put into new wine skins because the newness of the new cannot be contained by what is old. The eternal spiritual life of the new creation is far more powerful and dynamic than the old. That's why the first has to pass away before the new can come in its fullness. As long as the old is in place, the new cannot come because the old cannot contain the dynamic life and power of what is new. Just as Jesus said, if you put new wine into old wineskins, it's just going to break the skins. New wine goes into new wineskins. Now, when we go from Genesis directly to Revelation, it becomes clear that God has been committed to defeating evil. God committed himself right there in the Garden of Eden. He said to the serpent, he says, I'm going to crush your head. That's what I'm going to do. And so God committed himself. Evil is not going to triumph in this world. And by evil, I mean anything opposed to God, anything opposed to his purpose. God promised the serpent's head would be crushed. This crushing of the serpent's head represents the ultimate demise of evil in all of its forms, including the actual defeat of the devil. Satan's head was crushed at Calvary, yet it seems that the final victory is yet to be realized and will not be a reality until the new creation takes over. And John saw the, the devil cast into the lake of fire. But now we wrestle not, against, not, with, not with flesh and blood, but against Satan and his kingdom of darkness. It's actually dangerous for us to think that the final victory has been achieved because we will begin to think that we do not have to continue to wrestle with evil, and we do. But we do, not, we, we do excuse me, have to continue to resist the devil, but the Bible wants us to be assured that the victory will be completed. And that keeps us in the fight instead of giving up or living in denial as if it's not a reality. So God is going to defeat evil. The victory is the Lord's, not ours to achieve. God will defeat evil, and any victory we will have will come from the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now, the war has already been won, but God has promised that he's going to finish what he started. That's the message of Revelation. Amen. That's what John saw. John sees the final destruction of all evil. All the enemies of God and his people are utterly defeated and they're put away. They're not going to be there in the new creation. The crescendo is that God will dwell with his people forever. Yeah. And I think that's really, that's the main feature of the new creation. Amen. God's dwelling is now with man. So you see that God has never deserted humanity. Amen. Even though there were times when it looked like he did or that he should. There have been times in history like the days of the flood that Sister Ada referenced. Where it grieved the Lord that he created man. It, it, it may have looked like there were times when God has turned his back on humanity. But he never did and we know that when we get to the book of Revelation. And we see the dwelling of God's with man. God has not deserted the world. So Revelation, the book of Revelation, is the language of hope. It is symbolic language because it describes things that are outside of human experience. And so what John is really doing, what the Holy Spirit is doing through John, I should say, is he's, he's describing things to us that we have never seen or experienced using imagery of things we have seen and experienced or imagery that is elsewhere in the scriptures but it is symbolic language these images are designed to fuel our hope and expectation not necessarily to satisfy all of our curiosity and i think this is why so many people have trouble with the book of revelation we you know we would like to have all of our questions answered and and uh, the the book just simply doesn't doesn't do that but it does give us hope. Yeah. It's designed to, to whet your appetite, yeah. to ignite hope and desire in your life that this new creation is coming. I want that. Yeah. I want to be a part of that. That's what, the, that's what Revelation is designed yeah. to do. So if I can borrow from Milton, in Genesis, paradise is lost. In Revelation, paradise is regained. 
in between Genesis and Revelation is the progressive unfolding of God's plan of renewal. And what we're learning here, what the scripture is teaching us from Genesis to Revelation is that the God who creates can also renew. In fact, God's ability to create, excuse me, God's ability to renew is tied to his power to create. It seems that the first creation was made to showcase God's ability to bring renewal. In other words, God created the first creation as a stage on which the drama of redemption is going to be played out, culminating in new creation. The Bible says even angels long to look into these things that have to do with salvation. So it's like God is, he's showcasing his ability. He's saying, he's saying to, not only to men, but he's saying to these angelic powers, look what I can do. I can speak the world into existence. It says, you know, when, and when God created the world, the sons of God sang together for joy, shouted for joy, says that in Job. But see, there's some things about God that are going to be made known to these angels they haven't seen before. And that's why God made the world. There are a couple of times in the Bible that the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Or the related statement, for nothing is impossible with God, were uttered. The first time was to Abraham and Sarah. You remember when they were told they would have a son in their old age and Sarah laughed and and the, the Lord said, is anything too hard for me? Are you, are, really? Are you laughing at what I just said? Do, 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 you think there's, do you think this is too hard for me, Sarah? The second time, the statement, uh, for nothing is impossible to God, was uttered by Gabriel after announcing to Mary that she would bear a son while still a virgin. So, God can make an old barren woman give birth. God can make a virgin conceive and God can give birth to a new world too. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. The Bible is showing us this truth so that we will also believe in what God can do. When speaking about God's promise to Abraham, Paul affirms God's ability to, do, to fulfill his promise because he is the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Romans 4 verse 17. Now, the new creation actually began when God called Abraham. That's the beginning. The God who made the world from nothing would bless the world through an old man and his barren wife. And if you don't think God's capable of doing that, you're wrong. He did it. He can do it. So if God can do that, see, if God can create a nation from Abraham and his wife, God can make a new world. And this shows us, God worked this way to show us that the new creation can only be traced back to him. Just as the first creation came into existence by his word and by his will, just as he created a nation from Abraham and his barren wife, God is also going to make a new creation, and that's something only God could do. Only God can do that. There, there are some things that can only be accomplished by God. And by him alone. Only God can create something from nothing. It is often said that men have creative abilities and that this is part of the divine image in man. Now, I believe in the divine image, but man's creativity and God's ability to create are not the same thing. God had the ability to call something into existence that previously did not exist. God made everything from nothing. Can you do that? I can't do that. We can reshape and reform some of the things that God has made, but we cannot will something into existence that did not previously exist. So this is, this is theology 101 in a sense. Uh, God is creator, you are not. And yet people often live under the illusion that they can create their own destiny. That's the hallmark of the modern world. We're going to create our own destiny. But it should be obvious that if creation is a work that only God can accomplish, then the new creation is a work that only God can accomplish. 
another, another way of saying this is salvation belongs to the Lord. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot renew the world. We cannot make a new creation. But God can. And he's going to do it. He made the world in the first place. And he's going to remake this world, make a new creation. This means that our hope must be in God alone. We have to reject any man-made plan to renew the world, to save mankind from extinction, or to create utopia. We reject those kinds of things. It's not going to work. If there is one thing we learn from human history, it is that men have failed to renew the world. We See, men have been trying for a long time to make a new world. But there has been no philosophy... No form of government that has created a perfect world. Even our great scientific discoveries of the modern age have failed to solve all of our problems and have actually created many new and terrifying possibilities, including nuclear holocaust. That's what man does. The threat threat now is not that, that... The issue now is not that we're going to create a new world. The issue now is, are we going to blow up the one we have? That's, That's the issue now, thanks to modern man. And there has never been a cure for death. One of the great efforts, in fact, has been to try to get men and nations to stop killing one another. And that hasn't worked either. None of the world's great religions or moral teachers have changed the hearts of men. Something more is needed than just a law or a religion, or a government, or a philosophy, or a new morality. We've tried all those things throughout human history, and the new world has not been created. So it should be sufficiently demonstrated by now that men cannot create a new world order. If our hope cannot be in man, then we must look for hope in God. Specifically, our hope is in the person and work of Christ. Jesus himself is the firstborn of God's new creation. And we can see the renewing work of Christ in three distinct actions. There were three things that Jesus had to do in order for John to be able to see this new heavens and this new earth. Three things, three actions Jesus had to do. Number one, incarnation. God became a man. The creator becoming a part of the creation in order to renew all of creation, including men. If men are going to be renewed, this renewal had to take place through a man, just as sin and death had originally entered the world through a man. Incarnation. Secondly, atonement. It was sin that brought the curse of death and alienation from God. Sin's the problem, and this has to be addressed. God simply cannot pretend that sin never happened. And so by offering himself as a vicarious sacrifice, Christ has effectively taken sin away. Instead of laying sin on humanity, he laid sin on Jesus. And he took it away from the presence of God. So the cause of our, the original cause of our alienation from God, that's been removed. And God is now free to bless us in Christ. Atonement. Thirdly, resurrection. Death, the great enemy, has been defeated. Remember, the wages of sin is death. The Lord said, the day you eat of that tree, you'll die. You'll die. And the the process of death, he started working on humanity when they ate from the tree. And death is called the last enemy. It's an enemy, and Jesus has defeated it. The resurrection of Christ is a preview of things to come. Someday, all the dead will be raised, and death itself will be ended. Now, understand that Jesus is the only one who's been resurrected, but he's not the last one. He's the first fruits from the dead. A guarantee there's more to come. In the future, the resurrection of Christ is itself the promise and guarantee of the new creation. Him the heavens must receive until the time comes for the renewal of all things. That's what Peter said in Acts 3 and verse 21. And so we wait for his appearing the second time in the fullness of the new creation 
So God's new creation had to involve the work of Christ in his incarnation, his atoning death, and his resurrection. Those things had to happen before John could see this new world come into view in the book of Revelation. So our hope is in the work of Jesus Christ. We should make it clear that our hope is not, our hope is not in the world accepting Christ's moral teaching. It has been popular to speak of Christ as another great moral teacher, and all we have to do to have a new world is just get people to obey the Sermon on the Mount. Ain't gonna happen. The trouble with this view is that the world has never listened to the great moral teachers. That's what C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity. Jesus did not come to bring us another moral law. We already had one. And there wasn't anything wrong with it. God gave us the law of Moses to prove that law cannot bring the new creation. If life could have come by the law, it would have. And so what we could not do for ourselves, the law being weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son, Jesus Christ. And so the God who created the world will renew the world. And the third thing we see in this passage is that, and this, this may not be evident to us if you just read the book of Revelation, but actually the new creation is already here in a sense. John saw the new heavens and the new earth, the fullness of the new creation, but the new creation has already invaded The new creation actually invaded the night a baby was born to a virgin in Bethlehem. What John saw in Revelation was not the beginning of the new creation, but but was its its fullness. This This might cause some confusion because this old world still seems to dominate all that we see and experience. And we cannot ignore the reality of the old order. And we do so to our peril. But we can also not deny that something new has come. Solomon's old question, remember, is there anything new under the sun? That's answered in the gospel with a resounding affirmative. There is something new under the sun. The gospel calls us to participate in God's new creation now. The new creation has invaded and created a beachhead. Remember when the Allies landed in Normandy? In the invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe during the Second World War. Now when the Allies hit the beach that day on D-Day, there was terrible resistance from the enemy forces. But once that beachhead was secured, the end of the war was soon to follow as the invading forces advanced relentlessly toward their goal. In the same way, the kingdom of God has landed and it is advancing in the world. When Jesus began to preach publicly, he proclaimed that the kingdom of God had come. To prove his point, Jesus performed many miraculous signs that all pointed to the reality of this kingdom. Someone has referred to the miracles of Jesus as previews of coming attractions. In the kingdom, we would expect all of the effects of man's sin to be removed and Satan's kingdom to be removed. Those things have not happened yet, but Jesus gave us a sneak peek of the future. Remember, he said one time, he says, I'm I'm tying up the strong man and robbing his house. Jesus did not preach that the kingdom of God would come in the future, but that it was breaking in now and that we should repent and enter it in anticipation of its fullness in the future. Now, this is a very important aspect of this truth to understand and if we don't understand this we'll we'll become very confused we are caught now between the now and the not yet there's the now of the kingdom and there's the not yet of the kingdom of God the present reality of the kingdom and our hope for the consummation of God's reign is perfectly captured by the writer of the hymn this is my father's world This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong. That's the old order. God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Now that's some good theology. 
There is more to come, in other words, but we enter the kingdom now. The new creation begins for us personally when we are born again. Jesus said you cannot enter the kingdom unless you are born again, born of water and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of the new creation, just as the Spirit of God once hovered over the watery chaos of the first creation. And so it can be said of you, if anyone like you is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. You notice there that Paul speaks as if this is already a done deal. He speaks as if the newness of life were already a reality, and it is. You see, I must realize that God making things right with the world begins with him making me right. Much of what we call the Christian life is me coming to realize that I have been made new in Christ and that I must now live according to that newness of life. In other words, in a sense, I'm already in the new creation, in a sense. The old order is obsolete. And what really counts with God today is a new creation. That's what Paul said in Galatians 6.15. He says it's not circumcision or uncircumcision. What counts is a new creation. So you you got to ask yourself, am I a new creation? Am I a new creation? But remember, we still live in that tension between the old and the new creation. There's, there's still something left to be done. We still have the flesh. We still live in a fallen world that's ruled by the devil. And so actually, you're, the believer is a microcosm of this tension between the old order and the new order. It's this... this Struggle is in you. We are experiencing, along with the creation, the birth pangs of the new creation. That's what Paul said in Romans 8, 22 and 23. He said the whole creation is groaning as in childbirth. And we groan with it. He said longing to be, longing to have the redemption of our bodies. See? Now, when, when a woman's giving birth, she's not crying out because she's going to die necessarily. She's crying out because she's giving birth to something new. And so that's the situation we're in now. We're, we're experiencing these birth pangs, see. And the, the pain, it's not the pangs of death. It's the pangs of new life. The, there's a new world being born. And we're a part of that. So, so here's your great commission. Exploit that beachhead that the kingdom of God made. Live in the power of the new creation. Remember that if you walk by the Spirit... You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We've already tasted of the powers of the world to come through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So you have a person from the new creation living in you. We will not be everything now that we will be in the world to come. Now these earthly tabernacles, otherwise known as our bodies, frustrate us because they're tied to that old order. But do not have a defeatist attitude. There is a principle of new life in you through the Holy Spirit that is more powerful than the old order or the old nature. Even now, believers have the ability through the Spirit to live in victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And obtaining that victory is not an optional process. It's not just for the super spiritual. Every believer must begin to cut loose from the world and the old order And begin to live in the new creation. That's your commission, if you will. That's your great commission. Get rid of the old. Put on the new. Deny the flesh. Walk in the spirit. So we, this actually gives us, this this explains to us why we need to perfect holiness. You see, that makes that command make sense now. Perfect holiness. Subdue the desires of the flesh. Well, why should we do that? Well, because we want to fit into the new creation when it comes. When this world finally melts away and what's left is the new creation, we want to just be right at home, see, when that happens. And that's what's going to happen. It says God's going to shake everything that can be shaken. So what cannot be shaken will remain. And when that happens, you, you want to be at home in the world to come. In other words, we've been made new because God is making everything else new. He has made us new ahead of time. And you must become compatible with the new creation or you will be excluded from it. 
In Revelation, John sees many people who are excluded from God's new world. These are people who loved their sin and continued in their love of this present evil world, and so they are excluded from the new creation. If we are going to have a place in the world to come, we have to at some point lose our affection for this world. See, this puts everything in perspective. All of those commands about subduing the flesh, hating sin, being holy, love not the world, now all of that has bite. See, now you know why. Because there's a new world coming, and I, that's, I want to fit in with that. That's why. Our main goal is to, it has to be to make it into the world to come, not to make it in this world, because this world's passing away. Now, think about this. If you were going to leave the United States and live in another country, you would no doubt make some preparations. You would learn the culture of the country to which you are going. You'd learn the language. You'd learn about what they eat and how they live. You would familiarize yourself with the language and the customs so that you would be a good citizen of your new country. In the same way, the saints of God are becoming familiar with their new home, the culture of the kingdom of God and of the new creation. So when this world passes away, we will not grieve because we will be welcomed at that point into our true home. In the Chronicles of Narnia, when the old Narnia passes away and they find themselves in a new world and they're wondering where they are, it's Jewel the Unicorn who realizes what has happened and he declares, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up come further in. Now, perhaps this new world, as we're gathered together here tonight talking about the things of God, perhaps this new world is quite clear to our vision. But Monday morning is coming. And we have to go out once again into this present evil world. And this world has a way of creating a kind of fog in our minds that hides the world to come. In a sense, this world is the only thing hiding the world to come. This world and all of its demands, what Jesus called the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches, these things can come rushing at us every day like wild animals. And it becomes our duty every day to push aside the things of this temporal world order so that we can get a glimpse, no matter how fleeting it might be, of the new creation that God is about to unveil. Behold... I make all things new. So we already know the end of the story. We know where this is going. And since God has already revealed his purpose to us, it is our business to know what it is and get involved in it. We have no right to make our own agenda or to do our own thing. If we try to hang on to this world, not only will we lose everything here, we will also forfeit the world to come. But if we let go of this world, which we can't keep anyway, we can take hold of the new creation. Amen. Amen. And Brother Ricky's going to exhort us.